We are live, and I'm Gustavo Tolosa, and uh, today we are very excited because we have a super special guest, always, always welcome to have Dr. Lyle and, um, and learn from him. So today is our sixth session of reading the book, The Pleasure Trap, and um, so I have asked Dr. Lyle to give us a little overview of that chapter, chapter seven. And, uh, and then you, everybody, please feel free to write in the chat some questions that you might have. Some of you emailed me questions ahead of time, so I'll be asking a couple of those. So I want to welcome Dr. Lyle. How are you? Hey there, Gustavo. Great to, great to see you as always. You know, that picture in the background, uh, oops, always makes me happy. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it, it might be the, the color yellow that is such a happy color, but uh, yeah. it's, just, it's a happy picture. I can't remember uh, if I was more, uh, if I was a better student of the art, you know, I, I, I think it's, there, there's, uh, I think it's, I think it's a Monet. I think uh, it's, it's sunflowers. And so this was a, this was at an art class and everybody could see my obvious you know, talent. <laughs> it, is, it is very obvious. And do you remember when you did, how, how long ago did you create that master? That was about six or seven years ago. Oh. And, you know, it, 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 there was a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of money and a lot of time and energy went into all the art lessons that it, it took. <laughs> well, and what I what I think is that as years go by, that picture is getting more and more valuable. <laughs> <laughs> so in a, in a few years, or yeah. unfortunately, when you're dead, that might be a few million dollars. So. That's right. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And make sure you include it in somebody's will or something. Yes, you got it. We'll make sure we do that. Oh my. Okay. Well, uh, we have read, I have, this is my third time of reading the book, but I always, you know, we always learn from reading something numerous times, and especially something like this that it's dense, but yeah. it's not that difficult to read. I, I think that you just have to take your time and read and carefully, but. Um, it's um, it's it's just such a wonderful book. I don't have to tell you that. You, but um, would you say a few words about this chapter that we I assigned everybody <laughs> to read today, and then we can go from there and ask questions. Yes, um, this chapter uh, there. I, I actually my, my original thoughts on, on this were. Well, I'll just maybe I'll just start out. Uh, I, I was at the uh, I was at the True North Health Center in was visiting there for the day in about 1992. I was just visiting my friend Ellen, and the um, I had been, um, you know, I certainly he and I had had many discussions about about diet and and trying to people stay on track and so on. And uh, but he said, "Hey, would you just give a lecture?" And I thought. I, I've never, never given a lecture on this topic. Um, I was a young psychology professor at the time, so I had been was certainly comfortable lecturing, but I had never, and I, so I went into the kitchen at the old True North Health Center, and I said, you know, there's gonna be about 10 people there, and I have no idea what I'm gonna say. And so I, I, I took about 10 minutes and I thought, or less actually, and I thought, okay, well, what is, what are the main problems? And the in, in social psychology, uh, there's you know a, a couple of uh, interesting characters that were major figures in the field uh, were uh, Lee Ross and Richard Nisbet, and uh, I happened to be uh, teaching at the, the university that Ross was, was is an icon at, it's Stanford University. And Ross uh, and I would have discussions, and he was adamant about uh, what he called tension systems and channel factors. And, and so I thought, 
Okay, let me think about this from the standpoint of tension systems and channel factors. And this went back to the concept of, of essentially pressure on a nervous system to do a certain thing. And in particularly in psychology, we're interested in social tension. So when somebody may put somehow some pressure is put on you, it's, it's remarkable the changes that can take place in human behavior in a room. If somebody does some one little thing, it's like, ooh, everybody shifts and adjusts. So this is a very social and sensitive creature. Um, and, and so social tension systems and also what he called channel factors, uh, which is little tiny issues in the ease of operation that make a big difference in behavior. So, uh, for example, a classic study by Leventhal uh, was with, with uh, seeing that people, I think it would take a flu shot or something like this or a tetanus shot. And if you talk to them for an hour to convince them to do it, about 3% of people would do it. But if you talk to them for an hour and convince a group of people to do it and then gave them a map to the health center and tell them to think about a time the next week that they could stop by, about 27% of people went, 28, I think. So it was an amazing difference in percentages. And so that's what, that's what Lee Ross would term channel factor. In other words, did the channel open? Was it a lot easier for this to happen? So I went into the kitchen and I thought, well, tension systems uh, were clearly evident in social pressure. Channel factors were uh, obviously important ease of operation, how easy or difficult is it to get healthy food uh, if you wanted it, and how easy it is to get rich food. And then the third part of it was what I called at the moment biological tension, which is the, the desire of the organism to, to uh, conserve energy by getting the richest food possible. Well, so just to, just to brag here today, and it's a story I've never told, is that it took me like five minutes to come up with what would become 10 years later, the outline of the pleasure trap, the basic structure of it, which is pleasure seeking, pain avoidance, energy conservation. So that would come much later as a con concept, but those line up to what I originally termed biological tension. In other words, the drive for the pleasure of the richer food, social tension became in, in the back of my mind, what was running along with the concept of pain avoidance. So it wasn't actual pain. We don't actually avoid pain by eating rich food, but we avoid social pain by eating rich food. In other words, it's going to put us at cross purposes with other people. And therefore, this is going to get problematic. There's going to be tension there. And we're going to want to release that tension by going along with them. And then finally, channel factors would ultimately become a chapter I think you'll see later. Uh, which is about the ease and importance of energy conservation and how what a tremendous force that is drawing us into a lot of problematic food, but we can really work at organizing our vir environment to move it as close as we can to competitive to have healthy food be as easy as possible. So, but, so the chapter we're talking about was originally, in my mind, social tension, and the, the thinking of it came... Uh, really from discussions with Lee Ross uh, and the importance of, of what he would call tension systems. And this, um, and this takes us back to the heart of experimental social psychology, which is going to be at the heart of that chapter, which is the, the, the most dramatic study in the history of psychology, which is the Stan Milgram study. And so um, I went back and and read the original study in its entirety and, and Milgram's work uh, in order to write that chapter. And uh, Lee Ross and Richard Nisbet had, had actually come up with uh, an important concept in, in this, which was the notion that the people wanted to do one thing, but they didn't have an effective channel to do it. They couldn't, they couldn't figure out how to disobey. And uh, so Lee Ross was very centered on this, feeling like he had actually isolated and come to the core of the, the theoretical problem with the, with the Milgram study, i.e. doing something that you know is wrong, but, but you're feeling social pressure to do it, and so you wind up doing it. The, um, and I, I would reanalyze that and, and basically say, okay, 
Uh, Wasa Nisbet have made an extremely important point, but I don't think they actually understand what they're quite saying. And this is where I come up with the notion, uh, really out of deep biology, that this is a human instinct to uh, essentially preserve your status uh, with respect to following alpha in a tribe. And so this, uh, this winds up then being uh, a, a survival instinct. So you have competitive instincts that one of them says, I shouldn't be hurting another individual, but if he's not in my tribe and my tribe is telling me that I have to do this, then that is a survival instinct. Uh, and it is not simply a matter of not having a channel to figure out how to disobey. It's literally, it's being, uh, the, the animal is actually attempting to establish integrity, which means to integrate its actions with the most important biological outcomes. Now, so from there, I, you know, I'll wind up discussing the concept of integrity, uh, which is the, the problem of integrating your behavior with your most important values when those values are very confused. And so from there, I argue that the pleasure trap uh, in all of its, the little faces of the pleasure trap uh, winds up being an extremely confusing values problem uh, for human beings in, in various ways. Uh, but one of the most important will come into the situation where we're battling against our own biology in terms of the pleasure trap itself, in other words, pleasure seeking. Uh, there's also an ease of operation or the energy conservation mechanism is encouraging us to put our hand in the in the bowl, you know, in the in the chocolate pudding bowl that everybody's encouraging us to to have. And at the same time, now we're in a tribal situation or a social situation where it's being encouraged. And we're actually wanting to go against part of this values, trying to stay out of the pleasure trap and protect our health. But we're not actually sure that's the best survival uh, solution because the best survival solution may be to go along with other people uh, because the, the, the ancient calculus says, hey, we should make sure we're in good standing with the village. So you can now appreciate, uh, I think, uh, in the chapter and also in my discussion now, how deep and powerful this is in terms of survival instincts. So the, 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 the tempting thing is tempting because it's super normal. Now we know why, because it's very rich and high calorie density. It's also super easy. It's, uh, we're not having to cross a river for it. You know, we're not having to swim across a river of crocodiles to get to a, a Snickers bar. No, it's being offered. Not only that, it's a social process where we would be insulting other people um, uh, in, in the process. And therefore, that is threatening our most important value, which is to get along with other people. It's like, wow. So in that, in that first lecture um, 25 years ago, I... I realized that the that the best uh, the best example of social tension was the Milgram study, and so I I taught, told the story of that study. It's always a great study for anybody to hear. And so um, so at the at the end of that uh, lecture, I don't think I have the shark yet, uh, the famous shark for the for the pleasure problem. So I don't I don't know what I used, but I know. Uh, I'm confident I'm remembering that I used the Milgram study. And so 10 years later, when I'm writing The Pleasure Trap, uh, that would be uh, center the centerpiece and the concept of the difficulty of integrity and the fact that the pleasure trap in all of its little faces is a disruptive force in our ability to actually integrate the information and arrive at the most important value for us because our mind is actually under a lot of uh, of novel conflict, conflicts it's not designed to manage well. And so, um, so at, the, at, the, at the heart of it, folks, is the notion that our best hope for maintaining integrity, which is what we would want to do, because that, in other words, that's our long-term ultimate best interest, is preparation. And so uh, when, when we are in uh, conflict, that's when preparation can make all the difference. And so the story that comes out of this chapter is we need a few simple little rules. It can't be complicated. We need a few simple little 
social rules about what we're going to say. And we got to have them ready because these conflicts are coming and they're not conflicts that we're well designed to manage. And so uh, the, the story of the of getting along without going along is essentially being prepared for those moments when really all of our biology and the entire situation is against us. We're in trouble. And uh, our way out is to learn our way out by being prepared in advance for something that is going to be, uh, which seems so innocuous, but is actually quite, quite a difficult challenge uh, that can become much easier with preparation. So that's the, uh, that's how that, uh, that that's my sort of uh, synopsis. Oops, I think I lost Gustavo. The, oh, there you are. Okay. No, no, I'm here. Okay. Um, Dr. Lyle, yes, as, as I was reading the book again, I realized how difficult it is really today for, our, you know, our human uh, kind, yeah. because we are living in this um, environment that really is not I, I, what we're, we're supposed to. We have to deal with this social tension and other things that I don't think. I'm, tell me if I'm mistaken. But I don't think uh, in in in, in uh, you know many generations, thousands of years ago ago uh, that was so. Crucial. Yeah, we, um, we, we are not we're not designed to be at odds with the group. Right. Right. And so the, the there are more disagreeable people among us that are fine with it. Right. But I, I would say one of the more remarkable things that I've noticed is that even moderately disagreeable people, in other words, 75th percentile, in other words, they're 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 tougher than most people and more more of a pain in the neck than most people. But even they get pushed around by this. Like you've got to be, you've got to be a really tough customer. And uh, and you know John McDougall and Alan Goldhammer and, and Chef AJ, these people are all in the top five percentile for being difficult. Okay, <laughs> I mean they may right. smile and they may be pleasant and they may be smart and they they are uh, and they are extremely successful at managing these conflicts for themselves. But that's because they're 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 tough as nails. They're, they are not normal people. And, uh, and so even when we creep it down to, like I said, 75th percentile, well above average, even those people are sweating it, you know, at their, over at their in-laws or whatever it is. It's like, this is tough. And they, they, they feel the pressure and they, they, and they will get along and go along. And so we're trying to hear uh, get along without going along. And if we're going to do that, it's a, it's a hat trick. You know what I mean? We've got it's a little bit of quick magic and you know, distract right. over here while we're operating over here. And this is, this is how uh, we can get away with it, but you know, it, it doesn't come naturally. No. So it's, um, it, it's definitely, you would say that you would have to get like you were saying earlier be prepared yes and um, and almost like uh, you know act it out in your head and in front of the mirror because uh, when the time comes if you're not prepared you're going to go along yes most yeah, the, the good news is is that if you uh, if you read some of uh, some of the ideas that i have in there i.e um you know i'm running an experiment trying this out seems like it's working for me Right. And I'm not sure about anything. Uh, my doctor says it seems to make it sense. Seems to, it seems to be going fine. And not sure it's right for everybody. And probably not. Non-confrontational, right? Like all of the the same strategy. Um, this is all uh, uh, the. If you mess it up, relax. You're going to get another opportunity. There's no end to this. This there is like no a, a baseball right. game where the the pitcher never ends. They just keep throwing you pitches. So yeah. you're so that you can you can get there the first time you ever get a hit. You're like, hey, that was pretty easy, you know. <laughs> the, yeah. uh, so it, I can remember my dad who used to go to seminars to learn tricks. You know, it was going to make him rich somehow. And um, and one of them was a negotiating seminar. Um, they out negotiated him. He paid a lot of money for it. He didn't get. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. He's kind of an open character who was always open to learning new things. Right. Uh, but, he, but I remember once he came back all delighted with a trick. And that is that uh, he was also, strangely enough, he was a, a, always a bargain chopper. So he, you know, half of our house and my clothes or whatever would come from garage sale. My dad just thought that was really just a grand, you know, bargain in the world. And so he learned at one of these seminars that when you're looking at something and you say, well, and they, well, how much is that? And they say, you know, $20. And what my dad learned from a negotiating seminar was to say, well, what's the least you take for it? <laughs> this, it's so friendly i know it's this friendly little phrase and the first time he did it you know he i, I don't know if it was the first time but it probably was first time it worked like a charm and then then he my dad remained to the end of his life for the next 30 years absolutely delighted by that trick and so uh, and he felt like that trick, you know, was worth, you know, a small fortune to him. Probably right. was. And so wow. I, I learned the, like, I wouldn't know what to say in that situation. So I, I knew quite well that I would be uncomfortable in that situation. And so, right. like, literally that little line that I learned, uh, I think I've used it once or twice, almost <laughs> like biting my lip on <laughs> well, I'm going to use it now. I'm going to see that. I'm going to do that experiment. There you go. But that, but the the lesson is what what value in being prepared. And wow. uh, and since since that time, as a psychologist, I've of course talked to thousands of people in thousands of difficult situations. I just had one recently this last week where uh, a, a person that works for a I worked for a company and there was a, a small company and there was a, a misunderstanding about the compensation in the first year. And it was sort of a sales position and what the person thought they were getting and what it is that they actually got were quite a bit different. And they, they were, the, the, I, I understood they were all bent out of shape, but I actually understood where the company was coming from, and I could see that there was legitimate confusion. And so I said, okay, this is how we're gonna do it. You're gonna go to your uh, to the owner, and you're going to say, um, you know, I've just got a problem, and it's my own fault, okay? And it's, you know, I've got a mess here. The person had performed very, very highly and well, and so, it was absolutely worth it for the company to make up, to at least split the difference or actually make up the whole thing. And so I felt actually very confident that it would probably be half, okay? So uh, the missing money. And um, so I said, so you're gonna say that, it's your fault, and then they're gonna wanna pull it out of you, like what's going on? You're gonna say, well, here's the situation. And and then you're gonna say, well, you know, before I get started, can you tell me what your understanding is of the, of the, um, what we said a year ago. Right. And this is part of what I call crystal clear. So this is like, we need to understand what the other side, where they're coming from first. And uh -huh. so then once the, once the person said, well, this is what my understanding was. And, uh, and then I had the person say, right, that is exactly what's in the contract. That's exactly, I understand makes complete sense. That's not what I heard a year ago. Okay. Here's what I heard a year ago. Okay. And so then what actually happened was interesting. So here's what I heard a year ago. And this is what, um, that's what I heard. And that's what I was thinking this whole year. And the owner said, well, no, no problem. We'll just make it up. Okay. And, but we weren't quite ready for that, but we were pretty ready for it. We were ready. I was ready for a 50% negotiation. Right. Right. And what I said was, when the person, when your boss offers you 50%, you say, you know what? I want you to just, you know, go home and think it over. Anything is whatever is what's right for you is completely fine with me. I just needed to get it off my chest. I just wanted you to know because I have been frustrated and I've been just sitting on that. And it is my own fault. 
But, you know, that's super generous of you. But, hey, whatever it is that you feel, don't make a quick decision. Whatever you feel is right. Now, I felt actually that was an extremely clever way of moving it from 50% to 100%. <laughs> I actually, because I know humans. And uh -huh. this, this yeah. comes out of a, a characteristic of humans that uh, is was discovered by uh, a guy named Paul Zak in the Claremont Colleges. Uh, on the on the value of oxytocin and vulnerability, so you know what it feels like if you see see a little a dog go belly up on you, that causes you to have to flood your brain with oxytocin as you take care of. It, okay, this is a human characteristic, and yeah. um, and so some people like Alan Goldhammer doesn't have a lot of oxytocin <laughs> in that head. <laughs> <laughs> you better you might as well not try that so trick the uh alan's response to your problem is well you'll work it out no. No. <laughs> but but most of us have this feeling when someone's vulnerable of we want to help okay right, right. and so uh, and so i was counting on that i thought that that would probably work and i said yeah. you know yeah. going all the way right off the bat would seem a little seem a little too much i think that your boss is going to go 50 percent. you're going to back away like uh by the way if anybody wants to see a masterful demonstration of this it's the movie called dirty rotten scoundrels with michael Caine and steve martin that oh. that is the that is the best de uh, demonstration i have ever seen of vulnerability and oxytocin so uh -huh. these are con men okay and Michael Caine is a master at when they're trying, people are trying to give him money. Oh no, oh no, I can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a, actually a thing of beauty. And uh, I've actually never seen it uh, demonstrated in cinema before, but, but this is the concept. And so, so I, uh, my person was ready to say, oh no, oh no, and did, okay? And, uh, and, and the person on the other side, of course, had those feelings like, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to take care of you. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but again, a script. So in other words, uh, my salesperson was actually pretty irritated at feeling like they had been and was gonna, going to be assertive and confronting. And I said, no, completely the wrong solution. Okay. We're going to go in there, your fault, your, and get it all clear. And then now we understand, and oh, yes, and then we're vulnerable, and it's all fine. No problem. Got the whole enchilada. Okay? Yes. yes. This is the value of scripts. Okay? And so uh, script writing, uh, the scripts don't have to be long. Uh, we, we, we had broken it down to what I call a three-act play. Okay. Uh -huh. Very quick. You know, the first act, you're going to do this. The second act, you're going to do that. Well, that person practiced and had right. that in their head, you know, practice for 10 or 15 minutes in front of the mirror and then went in there and got, you know, a, the whole year's paycheck differential, which was, you know, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that, well, was, that was good. That was a good score. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that uh, most people, like you said, most people, when they see, uh, somebody vulnerable. Yes. They tend to, so that's been my position. Um, sometimes when I'm being pressured in, in, in a dinner or whatever, it's like, well, you know, I am, I'm going through some health challenges and, and I really, I'm trying something, see if it works. And so I, this time I'm not, I can't, I mean, you know, I'm not going to eat that, but, uh, and so usually, oh, no, that's okay. You know, yes. <laughs> people tend to sympathize other than, oh, no, that is going to kill you. You know, I don't eat that. Uh, right. It's, it's uh, totally that vulnerability. And uh, you, you we, we have really to well. become a little bit of a psychologist, I think, all of us, and just know that the, the world, it's not at this point uh, made for us to eat whole food plant-based and we have to be um, smarter and well not smarter but clever clever yeah yeah the, um, and the biggest thing that uh, of course that you the theme in there is um, I actually forgotten how I wrote that I'm sure I, I might have used the word status um, 
uh -huh. yeah. did, uh, I was not yet using the word esteem. And to, to cue uh, any of our listeners, that was a conscious change about 10 years later. So uh, by, by about 2010, I was realizing that I, I, would, I would feel that little edgy pushback whenever I would discuss status. I'd have to be so careful to, uh, to couch things. And I would still see the back of people's hair on the back of their neck stand up i.e. I'm not pursuing status. I'm not a creature that pursues status. Right. And right. like I, I would see all this cognitive dissonance when I was explaining that this was status. And I realized you're going to have to get out of that business. You're going to have to modify it. And I changed it to the word esteem. Everybody's willing to say that they seek esteem. Everybody wants esteem. That's okay. It's just not okay to want status. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So that, that is, well, status brings along with it. Um, esteem brings, actually comes from a French word from 500 years ago that means value. And that also meant money. Okay. So in other words, esteem is like value. Status is like I'm beating up on you or I'm trying to show off. So right. those right. have words have a constellation of meanings they don't have one meaning to to a biologist they just say yeah this is a status process but if you use that word the way i was using it uh and i believe i was using it there in that chapter in the pleasure trap that yeah. is going to activate some natural defenses in people yeah. so that nowadays i uh, it's a, it's called esteem and we can talk about it now and and actually probably more accurate because status comes with some connotations that we don't actually need in our theoretical uh, uh, examination of this. It's a desire to be valued. And so the problem is when we're doing things differently, and even if we excuse ourselves behind health vulnerability, the implication is your food is dangerous. And so th this is why it is we're walking on such eggshells. And so this is also why we have, you know, response number three in the same strategy, which is it's probably not right for everybody. Right. You know what I mean? We just we just absolutely put a blanket over anything anybody does by saying, hey, you know, different things work for different people. And I'm right. not even sure this is so great for me, but it seems to be working for me right now. Right. Okay. So this is the we're just selling a tentative, experimental, you know, open not utterly non-judgmental yeah. when we're doing that now interestingly enough it was a while before i grasped something gustavo uh in giving this discussion incidentally of the lectures that i've given the uh, people's the people's favorite lecture is getting along without going along yeah uh, that's always i mean the pleasure trap is a solid lecture people find it valuable and useful but getting along without going along depends on the audience. If it's a veggie audience, they love it. And yeah. you know, it's telling you how status deficient they feel. Uh -huh. They are so frustrated. Okay. And so I have to point out that we are designed by nature, as I say nowadays, to seek esteem. And if I said before, seek status, oh, no, that's a disaster. But if we say, oh, you're seeking esteem, in uh -huh. fact, you you are inherently designed for your for the esteem that you seek to be the most important environmental variable in your life. Um, the the weather from day to day is important, and the food around is very important. So there are environmental inputs that are important. But I have to tell you that for human beings in their natural history, the single most important uh, value is how what the tribe thinks of you. Okay, so uh, hold on once. Okay. Is my sound okay? So, so okay, okay. Oh, yeah. The, um, the um, so the uh, so this is so this is why we are so inherently sensitive, and we also want to earn that esteem from people in the village by sharing what we know. It's extremely reasonable that we would do so. Okay, and. Um, 
And so we have to temper our own psychology here and realize we're going to have to leave that esteem on the table. Okay. So we're going to have to be willing to walk away from that and let it go because we want to get along without going along. And if we're going to do that, we're not going to at the same time also earn a bunch of esteem from being the beacon of example and information where we're going to now tell you that what you're doing right in front of me is self-destructive and self-indulgent. That's not going to fly. So we have to, this is again, this is a la my Milgram analysis. We have to get the right value at the top of the value stack. Okay. And the most important valuable, valuable thing to me is to get along without going along. Now, to somebody who's more argumentative, it's like, no, I'm going to damn well earn the esteem that I deserve at this dinner table as I let everybody know how self-indulgent, self-destructive they are. And I show them what, you know, what uh, self-discipline I have and whether I'm on the right track. It's like if that, you know, that would be all of us would have that as part of our agenda. In, in me, it's probably 25 percent of my brain and the other 75 percent is I want to get along. If you're John McDougall, it's 100 percent of your brain and no percent of your brain cares if you get along at all. You don't no. care how upset everybody is. No. That, that's fine. And Alan's the same way. Alan, the only reason Alan wouldn't just flat out in, in a calm and dismissive uh, and utterly un-PC way of, dis, uh, of, of uh, blasting anybody would be because of his wife would be there. And he'd be like, well, then Jennifer would be upset. So, of course, I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's, that's, how it, that's exactly how he is. In other words, right. if you were to ask him, would you like some of that? He'd say, no, no, thank you. And they say, well, why not? You know, and it's like, well, because I don't want to get sick and die like the rest of you people. I mean, yeah. that's just it's we're just we're just one tiny little, you know, uh, twitch of a neuron away from a comment like that. That is what uh, most people that I've seen in my webinars and book clubs is the frustration of knowing Knowing well, basically knowing too much in a way. Yes. Uh, knowing how to help is like you have this patient that is bleeding on an operating table, and you know how to operate them and save them, and they tie your heads, and you. you, you so it's very frustrating. But um, I've learned. I have. I have learned to 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 deal with it, and I don't unless. Unless I can, and I can sense you, so, and I think we as humans being can sense if the other mm -hmm. person truly cares and wants yes. to know, or if they're trying to pick a fight or to disagree or make fun of you, whatever. Right. And uh, so my answers are like yours, you know, short, nice and short and totally uh, non-confrontational. And that usually works. Yeah. I would say... Um... Yeah, you bring up something that's important, which is that when you feel a sense of urgency, and so there are right. times when you're going to feel a sense of urgency. And so there are times when you won't, you won't be comfortable going to your grave knowing that you didn't speak up when, when, when a big thing was on the line. 